Assalamu alaikum viewers of Imam Hussain TV. First of all, I'd like to give condolences on the shahadat of Bibi Fatima Zara Salaamu alayhi alayhi salam to all viewers all over the world. Tonight's topic is simply put as Islamic divorce. Often we hear of very sad cases, someone's best friend, a sister, a brother, an uncle or an aunt, young or old who actually have to endure a painful time in their life by undergoing through divorce. Certain people feel and may actually encounter injustices. Mm -hmm. However, tonight, let's actually look into this subject and a topic that we'll have to actually explore in some depth today and inshallah maybe next week and also the following week. With me tonight, I'm glad to have also on the show Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, it's a privilege once again to have you here on thank this you. Show. Thank this you, thank you so much. This is actually a, a very, very deep and hopefully a meaningful topic. Inshallah, with your expertise and your knowledge and wisdom, we can, inshallah, impart a lot of advice, inshallah, to viewers because this is a topic that is surrounding everyone, in every community, locally and internationally. So without further ado, I'd like to just start off as it were, just by briefly, perhaps if you can um, shed light on the underlying tones, as it were, or the issues inevitably that lead to a divorce uh, in our marriage system. Uh, what could they be and what, you know, what encounters that people actually experience? This no doubt is um, one of the most sensitive topics to discuss, and I think Anybody who's been involved in a divorce will realize the sensitivities involved. There are many who have been in traumatic experiences and in no way whatsoever tonight do we mean to judge anyone or mm -hmm. do we mean to belittle what people have gone through. And that's why this is going to be the first in a number of parts on understanding sure. the social, historical as well as legal repercussions of divorce within the religion of Islam, because in the forthcoming parts, we'll also look at what happens after the divorce, what's happening with custody, what's happening in terms of finances, what's happening with family relations, and so on. So that will be coming in the forthcoming um, parts, but you notice clearly from the outset that the religion of Islam, in contrast to other religions which may not have allowed divorce to take place, yeah. rather other religions such as Christianity may have spoken about an annulment of a marriage right. rather than divorce. Okay. But the religion of Islam recognized that these two, who may have come from completely different backgrounds, there is a possibility that things may go wrong, as well as there's a possibility that you may have Khadija and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or Fatima and Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi wa sallam. So when the religion of Islam was quite practical on this front, in allowing a divorce to take place. And hence, within the Holy Quran, there are not only discussions of talaq in, for example, chapters such as so, chapter so. two of the Holy Quran, for example, from verse 228 to 231, or, for example, in chapter 66 of the Holy Quran, but there's actually a surah called talaq. Surah talaq, yes. And if you were to ask many Muslims in the world today, have you read the surah that is actually titled Divorce, I don't think there are many who even knew there was a surah called Talaq. talaq. That's, that's when you're bringing these chapters together, what you have is a general legal as well as a historical understanding of what's taking place in the nascent Muslim community in terms of marriage and relations as a whole. Right. And how the reality is that since the beginning or the onset of the religion of Islam until today, 
the gender that has been the most oppressed when it comes to divorce, either by culture or by certain, I would even say legal uh, statutes and principles which have been given to us in mainly patriarchal societies mm -hmm. is the female. Yeah. There okay. are sadly many cases in the Muslim world where females are oppressed, where their lives have been destroyed, where any complaint that they even tried to make about the abuse that they received fell on deaf ears. Mm. And I do hope that tonight we do something revolutionary Inshallah. in the Muslim world and humanitarian as well. And that is to try and speak not only on scenarios where divorce can take place, but also on rethinking in the forthcoming parts as well, the rights of divorce when somebody is going through a very difficult and turbulent relationship. Yes. This is something quite innovative because okay. hither to this point, the whole idea of divorce is husband has a right to divorce you. You as the lady have no right. And if you do have a right, you're gonna to have to give everything away that you have and get on with your life. Yeah. Possibly ridiculed. And that's for the fortunate few who have parents who may support them getting divorced. Yes. There are those out there who don't have the background, the basis, no. the parents no. to be able to move on in their life. But then we have to balance this with the traditions that are normally thrown at us. Right. Um, in the annals of Islamic history, traditions such as the Arsh of God shakes when a divorce yes, takes yes. place, or that the you know the halal, which is the worst of them in the eyes of God, is is uh, divorce. divorce. And so when you see these traditions, you're then stuck mm -hmm. that on the one hand the Lord, while allowing divorce, looks at it in a way which is seen as being Frowned upon. Frowned upon. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the male dominates. And the male looks at it and says, well, you know, I don't mind such narrations because they suit me. Mm -hmm. Because I have to give you the divorce for you to get out of this relationship. And if I don't want to give you divorce, I will make you go through hell. Yeah. And so there's a number of issues which I'm sure, sure we'll come to. Sure. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for that breakdown. Um, in the West, um, a number of marriages outside of Islam but let's just make it balanced now. In Islam, can there be a, a prenuptial agreement in the nikah, pre, prior to the nikah, as it were? A prenuptial agreement, if a person decides on a prenup, uh, for example, the lady decides yeah. in the prenup that she wants to have the right of a divorce, this can be done. It can. Um, you can have a prenup agreement as well that your husband cannot be in another relationship without asking for your permission. Right. So the prenup, it's up to the couple. If you two, for example, are an engaged couple. Okay. Um, and you decide that there are certain areas you want to agree on beforehand. We see the prenups occurring in many parts and many communities in the world today generally. It's not mm. just Islamic, especially yeah. if you're a billionaire. That's You're right. always trying to look after the prenups. And sometimes you even see these Hollywood actors. Protecting assets. As you and know. actresses, absolutely yeah. right. They yeah. protect yeah. their assets because they're thinking, if we're going to break up, mm. you can't have access to my house in Manhattan. You can't have access to my house in Beverly Hills or in Paris or in London. Yeah. So they make these prenups. Mm -hmm. So likewise, Islamically speaking, before a couple decide that they want to get married, they can also have a prenup. Right. And that prenup will entitle, for example, the lady will say that I want... Um, you know, the unilateral right to divorce, okay. which normally is associated for the men yeah. uh, Islamically, that lady can say, well, before that, I want to make sure that I have that as well. Okay. And just continuing on from the prenuptial agreement, is it advised to have it, actually? How, what, what, what is the well, consensus? Well, the, the thing is, I wouldn't necessarily say there's traditions that no. are speaking about the istihbab of having a, a, a prenup. Yeah. And I would say... On a practical level, mm -hmm. if from the outset, for example, you have uh, somebody telling her fiancé that, listen, I want a prenup now. Right. now. I've got the right to divorce. Then already the relationship is quite, you know, it's quite a rocky start to the relationship. Okay. Because I think as soon as someone hears that, you know, you hope that you're going to live with each other 
sickness and health, good times and bad and so on. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're told, well, have you put down that I can divorce at any time? Now sometimes I could see where those ladies may be coming from because they've seen their mom in a very abusive yeah, relationship, yeah, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Seen the, the father beat the mother black and blue. And when that happens, you'll have that situation where she's thinking, hold on a minute, I don't ever want to be in that predicament. No. No. Where dad has literally told mom, what are you going to do about this? Mm. Even if I am going to beat you, your family are not going to let you get divorced. You're helpless. The community will frown upon you. And there are certain countries in the Muslim world where divorce is a nightmare. You know, mm. if you look, for example, I'd say if you're looking in Iraq, for example, or you're looking in Pakistan, for example, divorce can be an absolute nightmare because... Mm. It really is the end of the world for the ladies in some of those societies. And the men know it. The men know that the legal system works in our favor. Mm -hmm. I am the man and I have a right for divorce. And now if I'm not giving you the divorce and you're telling me you're unhappy, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. The assets in many cases are in my name. It's a tribal society in many cases where the male dominates. Right. And so when a person hears about this, you cannot blame some of our, you know, younger sisters who are looking to get married. You can't blame them when they turn around to you and say that, listen, I want a prenup. Yeah. Now that likewise works with the, with the, with the ones who are saying to their husbands, that I want a prenup that you will not be with anyone else while we're married. Okay, okay. Now, I know that this may devastate some guys who are, mm. you know, who are enjoying what they're enjoying on the side. Uh, the reality of it is, is quite clear uh, everywhere, irrespective of your religiosity or your religious standing, you may find that there are people, religious or non-religious, who may have a religion on the side. Yeah. Now, someone might see that and say, well, I want to put that down in the prenup. If it's down in the prenup, it's like a contractual agreement. It is, it is, yes. And you know, those contracts are binding. Yeah. A person can't turn around and say, well, I, I have my own worldview and that prenup doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. If you two have decided on this, then you have to go ahead with this. Yeah. You have to go ahead. So right. I personally remember being involved in a case a few years ago where I didn't recommend okay. that sister in our community to impose, one. to impose this in the prenup because I said don't judge every guy by what your father did to your mom. That person who's come in the household doesn't deserve to be frowned upon because yeah. what can also happen is that when I know that this is in the prenup, anything that I sniff where there's just a hint that there may have been a relationship, a hint, well, I have the right for divorce. Yeah. And therefore, when I have this right, I may end up, I wouldn't say the word is abusing it, but it may lead me to even investigating further and yeah, saying and that, you know what, how can I, and losing trust and so on. And being suspect. Being suspect, were, Even exactly. that is spoken of in the Holy Quran. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've already got questions coming in, viewers. So uh, one question is um, from Copenhagen, uh, Fatima. Um, so she hasn't really alluded to um, her spouse's name. So they've been engaged, um, but does the engagement, as it were, count as a real nikah? Or is the nikah actually part of the actual ceremony itself? Well, we've, we've been born... Because, because in the West, let's, yeah. let's, be, let's be frank. That's it, yeah. In today's world, irrespective of what culture you come from, Indian, Pakistani, Iraqi, Iranian, some cultures insist in having a engagement. Yeah. And some would say, no engagement, it's not for us, and we would just go for the nikah. So if you can just probably just put it out there, as it were. The engagement and the nikah. When it comes to the engagement, we're used to this in the, in the Western world. Yeah. That someone says, who is this? Say, oh, this is my fiancé, for example. Yeah. And they say that we're engaged. What that engagement means is that we're together mm. and there's a, a marriage to look forward to in the future. Yes. yes. Muslims recognize that you cannot just be in any relationship, even if you know you're going to marry that person, mm -hmm. without there being a contract. Contract. Absolutely. But some Muslims out there face a predicament. He, as the father-in-law, has just accepted 
this boy to marry his daughter. Yeah. But the wedding will take place in another nine months. Mm. So what do they do? They get engaged. In that period when they're engaged, some decide to have the nikah or the aqid or the katbik tab in that period. Right, right. Yes. The problem with that, uh-huh. remember the wedding's about nine months away. Yeah, yeah. In the eyes of everybody, you're engaged. In the eyes of God, you're married. married. And that means if a month later, you're engaged, you're not living together. When a month later you decide that this isn't for you, then talaq, divorce, has to be pronounced. Right. The community doesn't forgive. No. And so the community, no. when they look at this, what are they going to say? Say this person is a divorcee. Yeah. The person's never lived with the girl. The person and this girl have never lived under one roof together. Yeah. But because we've decided that a nikah or an aqid takes place, what we end up with is a situation where you have somebody divorced who has never even had a wedding. Mm -hmm. So someone says, what's the solution? Solution, for example, someone can be involved in a mut'ah. Yeah. Now I know whenever we say the word mut'ah, straight away you've got people, eyebrows raised, frowning, yeah, frowning in some cases, yeah. because they grew up with this understanding, mut'ah is when a man who's married is just playing on the side mm. with a temporary relationship. Whereas no, on the contrary. No. The temporary relationship practiced in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, by his companions. Now, annulled, prohibited, who did it? We, yes. we leave that for another exactly, day. Exactly, exactly. The fact is that he allowed this temporary marriage. The Shia call it mut'a. Mm -hmm. Others then would have other terms for their relationships different from what mm. was normally seen as the, as the, for example, the nikah. They would someone say orfi and misyar and what yeah, in Egypt. <coughs> and I know that many have their legal debates, but yeah. if your daughter is now engaged, now obviously her and her fiancé want to go out with each other. Yeah. Can't just go out because they're going to get married in nine months. No, Nor nice. do you necessarily want to do the ket miktab or nikah because you know that there will be, if they break up a talaq, even though there's no wedding yeah. done yet because they've done a aqid. So the mut'a, can be done. The mut'a. What mm -hmm. happens in that mut'a? The father, for example, can set the conditions as to how much they can interact. Yes, absolutely. The father can say <coughs> that I allow you two, for example, to go out with each other because I don't want the community looking at the two of you. Mm -hmm. And me being in, you know, having a uh, sort of losing my reputation as you were. Exactly. Yeah. So we do this in the proper way. Yeah. So I want you two to be together and I want this all done in the proper way. And the father can say that, for example, you, you can be together and physically, that guy might want to hug his missus, mm. you yeah. know, and that guy might want to kiss his missus. Sure. And that person may want to hold the hands of his missus. Yes. But the father says that, listen, <coughs> anything further than that, I'm not allowing. Yeah. And so when the father says this, he can make this condition. Mm. And they agree a dowry, and they agree a time period. Yes. Because they may have come to a conclusion that the wedding will take place, let's say, in December. The family have accepted the boy in January. Yes. So there's still 11 months left until the marriage. marriage. Mm. And so because of that, in those 11 months, the father can stipulate. Okay. And when the father has stipulated this, then this is a proper engagement. What happens if the two of them break up? Nice. So if the two of them break up, they are broken engagement. Yes, there's no harm. There's no harm. No. Because there's no aqid or no ket biktab done in the sense of the Absolutely. permanent marriage. Absolutely. And also, yep. if I can add as well, um, you actually uh, mentioned it indirectly, but just for the sake of viewers, mutah does not have to be sexual. It can just be for you to be interacted in a halal way, as it were, subject to the permission of the, the father if the lady is a, a virgin. So. That also in itself is, I think, sometimes misinterpreted. Sure. Um, we've got another um, question. And this question is also from abroad. Um, Ali and Sakina, um, they, uh, just, let me just <coughs> paraphrase uh, what they've actually mentioned. Um, they've had their nikah um, pronounced, um, but also engaged. So that also, that scenario is also thrown in there. Um, but they haven't consummated the marriage due to whatever reason. Is there an idda period? There is no idda. 
if the two of you have been involved in the temporary marriage mm -hmm. and the permanent marriage. Right. Okay? Okay. So you've got, uh, let's say, someone who's in the temporary marriage, someone who's been involved in permanent marriage. While there has not been consummation, mm -hmm. then there is no idda period. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Viewers do call in for... Um, questions as well. The telephone number is 0203-515-0199. You can also text or WhatsApp your questions on 4407939-917163. Once again, WhatsApp 4407939-917163. So now just to continue on, um, there's some questions that are coming in um, indirectly and they've actually been um, waiting as it were. Um, the, there's a, a sister, and she mentioned about marrying a man previously, um, but found out later on, after a duration, um, that he was impotent. Um, is this a qualifying <coughs> factor for a divorce? And just before you answer that, do they just break up? What, what goes on around that scenario? Yeah, this is a dev devastating situation mm. for anyone. Um, and there are, sadly, ladies out there who have even spent... I remember a case where right. there was a lady involved in a marriage. She was involved with a person six years. Mm -hmm. Six years. He had not consummated the marriage. Now, that is probably the most patient human being. Even Prophet Ayyub yeah. will testify to her patience. Because that is absolutely phenomenal. How you're able to be with somebody yeah. who for six years, there's no consummation. Yeah. There are others at the moment who have been together for a year. Yes. No consummation. There are others who may have been together for two weeks. No consummation. Now, each one is different. Right. And we have to make a principal point jurisprudentially from the outset. Okay. And that is... Is this person aware of their impotency? Mm -hmm. You married someone. Yeah. That person is aware of their impotency or no? Right. If the person is aware of their impotency and deceived you, mm. it's different from the one who may be going through stressful. a turbulent, stressful time. Yeah. Let's see yeah. the difference between the two. There's someone out there, they've been involved in a marriage, and that marriage they were involved in, they knew very well. They had, for example, erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. They knew very well that there was problems where they were told that they could never have kids yes. and so on. Or that person knew very well that even being aroused by the opposite gender was a problem. There are people out there yeah, yeah, sure. who will say to you that I, can, I, don't, I, just don't, I just don't have it in me. Yes. That when I'm with somebody in the bedroom, when we take off our clothing, I find it disgusting. I find it difficult. Yeah. They may even want the light switched off and so on. So, when this happens, that person is fully aware. Right. Sometimes, sadly, in our communities, what happens is even though the family know this person had an impotency issue in their marriage, mm -hmm. They let that person marry somebody else without informing the poor girl that this person, for example, has erectile issues. Yeah, this sure. person finds it difficult to get aroused and so yes, on. Yes, yes. And that is oppression. Mm. And that type of person, the moment you realize there's this issue, annulled marriage, divorce right. takes place. I see. Ah, that's a different situation because that person is aware of their impotence. Okay, and just, just before you continue, sorry, say now, what is a, just a brief uh, uh, definition of annulment and divorce? Well, you, normally what you would have is when a divorce is about to take place. Divorce, yeah. what does it mean? When you see a talaq in the Arabic language, you it's look at the dictionary. Two part. Uh, no, something that was shackled okay. and now is freed. Okay. Okay. Something that was locked and now is to be freed. I see. So when the Arabs would talk about the camel uh -huh. and the word divorce or talaq in relation to the camel, right. the camel is tied up. Okay. And then when the talaq is done, that camel is free so, to go and roam okay. Okay. rather than being tied right. up. Right. This dunya, for example, is something that shackles us. Right, yes. This dunya can encapture us. Mm -hmm. 
When Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam says, I've divorced you a three point three divorce, yeah. of which there is no return, yeah. it's not just a matter of I am now untied, but now I'm broken away from you. Yeah. I'm free to reach the heights which you were trying to stop in some cases. Yes. Okay? Yes. Yes. So now, when we're coming to annulment, annulment is not something that's going to require what the divorce is going to require. Divorce is going to require what? We're going to need those two witnesses. Yes. The two arbiters. Right. Correct? Correct. We're going to need all of that to come together. Mm -hmm. We're going to need maybe a period of separation. Okay. We're going to need all of these areas to come together. Annulment happens the moment, for example, you have realized that there is an impotency issue. Okay. No need to go to Mawlana Saab and sit with Mawlana and right. you know Mawlana, right. what's your opinion? What's my opinion? What do we do? What did she say? What did he say? Come back to me. No, no. When a person is impotent yes. and they were aware of their impotency, annulment takes place. Now let's look at the other way. If you have a case where you're not aware of your of yes. an impotency. Okay. Yeah. You may be someone who, for example, either knows of their sexual prowess. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or you may be somebody who is a virgin mm -hmm. in their innocence. Yes. But is never known of themselves to be in any spot of difficulty and so on. A couple of weeks into the marriage, that person's finding it extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. Difficult why? There may be stress in their lives. Yeah, sure. There may be a certain, there's even peer pressures. Yeah. That, for example, in some communities, they will actually joke with you tonight. And this is, and sometimes these types of jokes, in some cases, insulting. are very sad. Yeah. Insulting. Yeah. And in some cases, aren't showing a respect to that person's feelings with their partner. True. Some communities even ask for the cloth to see if the girl has, is still in her innocence. Yes, yes. Now, yes. imagine that pressure that's there. Because I don't think many people realize that also when you, when you consummate a marriage with someone who's still in their innocence, blood doesn't necessarily have to come out. No, no. Okay, and so there's some people who are under pressure and that's impression. Mm -hmm. ah. So you're tired in your wedding day and you're not able to consummate this relationship. A week later, you're not able to consummate this relationship. You move on, a month later, you're not able to consummate. In that stage, mm -hmm. we advise that a person resorts to counseling. Right. Resorts to those people who are specialists. Maybe even take a time out with your partner. Yes, yes. To reflect on a different environment mm -hmm. to where you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So when you're looking at all of these, in that case, is that impotency leading to a divorce? No. No. Because in that case, that person himself is telling you that I am not aware of this. Right. Now, you too may decide that this break is, is really causing harm to your relationship. Because I don't think there's any lady out there who's watching the show who wants to be the one who's in a relationship where her husband does not find strength when looking at her yeah. in their peak, for example, right. you know? Right. Yeah. Um, I, listen, there may be people now who may be in their 50s and, and may need the help of certain pharmaceutical, pharmacy drug dealers to provide them with a couple of tablets to help them gain their strength. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but then there may be those in their 20s and you're wondering what's going on. You're in your 20s. You're at your peak, what, what's, why is this happening? But I think in those cases, to hold on to your partner, to support them in this difficult time. Is the noble act. Is the noble act. Yeah. Now, when I hear stories of those six years, for example, yeah. that's a difficult one to comprehend sometimes. Yeah. When you hear somebody has been in a relationship six years mm. yeah. and they're finding it extremely difficult, this is something to in some cases praiseworthy, and then it's completely up to them. Of course, yeah. of course, alhamdulillah. Um, we've had another message, as it were, yeah. a question. Um, fortunately, a sad occurrence. A sister, um, she didn't want to give her name, um, but she married someone uh, in Islam, being Muslim herself, yeah. um, fell in love. Uh, the husband changed, as it were, his aqidah, and then stopped believing in Islam, as it were. Um, <coughs> now, is she stuck in that marriage? What rights does she have to divorce him or not? Um, can their marriage be annulled? Apostasy mm -hmm. in Islam. In Islam is one of the uh, one of 
the ways or one of the conditions for a marriage which can be uh, annulled right away. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, 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 may, I may see it as a reflection of the example, and we may relate to the example of impotency. Right, right. I get married to somebody who's on shaky ground in terms of some of their religious beliefs. Okay. And I really don't mind if somebody questions the theological tenets of the religion of Islam. I don't have a problem with it. No. Anything done with respect is fine. Yeah. If I get married to somebody who really, I, in the engagement period, I should have sussed out uh, that they've got certain doubts about the... You know, you uh, should have sussed out that when you're having these discussions in the engagement period, try and discuss the things that really matter. You know, discuss the opinions on on your closeness to God, on the love of God, on how you want to build the family yeah. and the spiritual life. Some will suss it out in the engagement. But let's say mm -hmm. that a week into the marriage, you two are on your honeymoon and you're sitting on that beach in the Maldives, which I, I suppose is the archetypal place where, <laughs> you know, people... Um, and you probably are not really going to be thinking about Islamic theology too much, but let's say you're sitting, having your dinner and the person you're with turns around to you and says to you, you know what, I... I I don't really believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family was infallible. I think his life, for example, he, that person might turn around and say, I think his life, you know, is a life where mistakes may have yeah. happened. When that is said, is that necessarily an act of apostasy at that moment? Not necessarily. Because that person might turn around and say, listen, I respect the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And I believe he's the final prophet of God. But I just believe there were a couple of occasions where a mistake may have happened. That person's not an apostate. Why do I say that? Because there are many Muslims who believe that, but they're not apostates. Mm -hmm. There are Muslims out there in the world who believe that yeah, Satan may have affected the prophet, peace be upon him, his family, but God rectified the situation in the famous um, uh, well, the book that came out later on called The Satanic Verses was yes. based on, on those verses in Surah 53 of the Quran. So there are Muslims in the world who believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, made mistakes, yeah. but we don't call them apostates. No, no. We say that these are part of the, uh, the Milla, they're part of the Ummah, of the religion of Islam. Then there are others out there who, for example, maybe your, your husband turns around to you and says, you know what, you say we can't see God, I believe in a God who we can see, and he's got hands, and he's got feet, mm -hmm. and he's got a beard, and he's sitting on a throne, and I don't care what Shia theology says, I believe that every single verse that mentions Kursi, or that mentions is Arsh, literal. or that mentions Yed, or that mentions Ayn, is literal. Yeah. Yeah. When that person says that, again, have they become a Murtad? Have they apostatized? No, no, they haven't. That person may uh, be somebody who believes what a lot of Muslims in the world today believe, yeah. that God literally sits on a throne with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family next to him on the day of judgment, and that... Um, God has a beard and that God has a shin mm -hmm. and that God when he wants to put his feet in, into yeah. hell and so on. So has he apostatized? Certainly differed with Shia theology, but yeah. no. Then I may have somebody who completely says, you know what, all this Islam is nonsense. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in any of it. I don't believe in God. Okay. I don't believe in the prophets. I don't okay. believe in the angels and I reject the book. Now, at this stage, at this moment, again, there's the ones mm -hmm. who are involved in the, in the early days of their marriage. Yes. And there are those who are 21 years into their marriage with three kids. Some of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, some of the ladies were married to men who weren't interested in the religion of Islam and therefore their marriage was annulled because that right. person is, you know, a Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim Muslim man. man. Yeah. In the case of somebody who early in their relationship, their husband has said such a thing, just be a bit patient. May have been a really frantic, you mm, know, mm. A, a crazy day. He's just lost it completely yeah, and yeah, said something like that. Yeah. In the case of those who are married for 20 years as well, right. there's no harm taking the husband of yours at that moment. Say, listen, let's sit with Sayyid Amman, for example. Let's sit with Sayyid Fulan, Sheikh Fulan. Let's yeah. sit with somebody yeah. in the community who you can pose your theological questions to. Mm -hmm. If after posing your theological questions to them, there are still doubts, and you still don't believe in this. And by the way, I've been involved in two cases where this okay. happened. Okay. Two cases. And although the wives were very adamant that their husbands stay, because there's obviously love, love involved, there, yeah, there's yeah. kids involved. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot to lose. 
Yes, and the Quran says, Lakum dinakum wal yadeen. To use your origin to me is mine. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to believe, let them believe. And whoever wants to disbelieve, let them disbelieve. لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدِّينَ There's no compulsion religion. If the person has reached a conclusion that Mrs. Dawkins and Mrs. Hitchens and Mrs. Harris are providing them with an understanding of the cosmos or how all of this originates or morality or 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 it's completely up to them what they want to follow. You know, who am I to come and stop it? Yeah. Um, but I would say don't stray away. Although, yes, in Islamic law, someone who apostatizes, the marriage is annulled. Right. End of story. Okay. But I think on a practical level, okay. there should be a case of more discussion and more dialogue. In yeah, Shukun, yeah. thank you for that. Uh, so now we're going to go for a break in the next couple of minutes. Just before we go for a break, I do urge viewers, please, to call in and also donate um, to Imam Hussain TV. Imam Hussain TV is relying on on your donations throughout the world. And in order for us to make good programs and good content and have great guests such as Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani, we do need actually donations uh, to sustain this channel, inshallah. Um, just food for thought, um, Say now we'll go to a break very um, soon. Um, there's also been another um, concerning case that I've heard of recently where um, a couple married, they're clearly in love, but one of them hasn't let go of the past. And his part, his ex, as it were, is still communicating with them. Um, we'll probably continue this after the break, but how does that leave the scenario going forward, as it were, if they're already married? Um, Yes, uh, uh, and we may need to break you there. Sure, so, sure, sure. Yeah. We'll answer that directly yeah, yeah, after yeah, the break. Yeah. Is that the best way? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Let's come back Let's inshallah do this after, after the, break. the next break, inshallah. So see you again, inshallah. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show where we're actually discussing Islamic divorce and this topic is so deep that we shall inshallah be elaborating it in a further series next week and also subsequent weeks inshallah. Assalamu alaikum Sayyidina. Wa alaikum as -salam. Dr. Omar, um, just prior to the break we just set the tone as it were for a couple who are clearly in love um, but the, the husband hasn't really let go of his past. Um, his ex, let's make it easy, his ex-wife um, is still in contact with him. And his current wife, um, call it jealousy, just clearly does not like it. What, what issues are potentially going to arise and what, where is yes. it going to... Well, it depends what level of contact we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there are different levels of contact. There is somebody who, uh, who maintains, uh, you know, a relationship of respect mm -hmm. with, uh, let's say, their ex-wife. It could be a situation where, you know, you and your ex-wife have kids together. Right. You know, you can't right. just all of a sudden expect the husband to abandon any mm -hmm. communication. However, if the wife does, for example, see certain messages yeah. where, you know, the person is speaking to their ex-wife in a way um, which can lead onto something mm -hmm. which could damage the relationship, then the wife has every right to speak. Right. You can't move on and marry somebody while you still entertain thoughts mm -hmm. of being with somebody else at that time. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. just be blatant about it from the beginning. Of course. You know, there are certain people who enter marriages and they should just from the outset say that look i have feelings for somebody else but i'm gonna try and make this work so that person on the other side knows that listen if you've got feelings for someone else let's not go ahead with this yeah, yeah. however there are some also it requires a bit of patience with them as true, well true true that they they not necessarily going to do anything wrong 
even if they have a communication with somebody who's in their in their in their past mm -hmm. or in their you know in their history. And I don't think a person should be too rash at that moment. Right. There should be open communication between the two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a case with uh, a sister Batul, and she said that uh, I live abroad, and she doesn't want to give any further de uh, details. Um, however, she's living with the Indoors, and she's actually mentioned that she's forced to wake up approximately 4 a.m. Um, when her f dear father-in-law also wakes up um, and requests for breakfast to be made. Yeah, that's mad. And she's... Um, that's crazy. Sh she's actually alluded to the fact that it's becoming a bit of a nightmare and, you know, it's... Uh, she's still newlywed, um, but she feels like a slave. And yeah, yeah, she's got every right to say that. I don't know. Well, there are some people out there who marry girls to become slaves for their parents. Mm, clearly. clearly. And that's, that's absolutely ridiculous. Not, not part of the teachings of the religion of Islam at all. You know, uh, I, I see it change now, but there are many out there who yeah. force their wives to literally cook, clean everything for the in-laws. Now, yes. before the marriage, I think if you do not make it clear that you are not necessarily one who wants to live with the in-laws, Mm -hmm. then sadly, this situation is a possibility. But when you hear that there are ladies, newlyweds, who have to wake up, when their father-in-law wakes up, to go and make them mm -hmm. breakfast. I can imagine this, don't get me wrong, I can imagine this in 1921 in a village in India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can imagine this in a village, let's say in a part of Iraq somewhere. But it still goes on. When I'm being told that this still goes on, and the father and the mother-in-law believe that they have this right, yeah. that you have come into our house, you clear this table, you clear the house, you clean the house. When we wake up, breakfast should be ready. I personally think that this is absolutely ridiculous. So, and I believe that there are a lot of Muslim men out there mm -hmm. who know that when their wife lives with the in-laws, they can do what they want, yeah, yeah, yeah. treat her as bad as they want. And the moment she starts to just say that, look, for example, I slept last night late and your dad wants me to be up in a couple of hours. You want me to be with you when I'm sleeping this late. What do you want me to do? And they will tell her, listen, either you behave or I'll kick you out. Yeah. And there are many Muslim men out there. And that's why I've always said religiosity is not in the length of your prayer, prayer or the fast, as you know, the imams would say. Religiosity comes in the way a person's morals are, the way they behave with mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And if you're somebody who's behaving with your wife in this way, yes. then as the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family made it clear, the best of you is the best to their family. And I'm the best with my family. When have you ever in your life read a narration from any of the imams where they made their wife get up and cook for their families, where they made their wife get up and cook for the in-laws, where they forced their wives to live with their in-laws. Where is this from? If you're telling me in India, your family's been doing it for 100 years, in Pakistan, you wanted to continue the trend. Yeah. And some will say, look, the houses that we live in, it helps. Yes, there are people who live in mansions you know, seven, eight, ten bedroom houses where you can have your separate quarters and live with the in-laws. I can appreciate that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then there are others who will cram the in-laws, like the daughter-in-laws, with the sons, and you may have them all living in the same house. Yes. Now, don't get me wrong, it can work, mm. but it can also lead to a lot of oppression. Of course. Yeah. So poor Betul, the one who's asking this question, when she's saying that at 4 a.m., she has to be waking up to make breakfast for her father-in-law. Father-in-law, go get yourself a maid. Yeah, yeah. There's many maids out there. True. There are agencies. Let me just advise. Maybe people don't know. There are agencies where you can go and get a maid. You, that girl that you took from the person's house, you have not taken somebody to be your slave. No. And if you find that you are now in your 60s and your 70s, and you can't move around as much, therefore that daughter-in-law's got to do everything for you? No, that's not Islamic. No. No, it's not. 
You're in your 60s and 70s, and if you're going to become a burden on somebody, and I know that this is very sensitive. Why? Because it's an honor for us to look after our parents. Yeah, true. It's an honor for us to be there for our parents the way they were there for us. But at the same time, it's abuse. I cannot abuse this to destroy a girl's feelings. True. The amount of girls who cry in the middle of the night, ladies who cry in the middle of the night, because of the way that they have been ridiculed and laughed at. And what's the excuse? But you know, my dad or my mom's old. Your dad and your mom's old is not an excuse, excuse. for you to oppress this girl. Yes, absolutely. So then when this girl wants a divorce, which I don't necessarily recommend because your husband is still somebody you love and I'm sure this can be worked out. Mm. But the moment the girl wants a divorce, what does the community say? You know how bad she is? She is. You see these modern girls? What do you mean modern girls? It's not about modern girls. Ethics is ethics. Yeah, true. And I, and I cannot be more passionate about this because I've seen so many examples in the Muslim community where we have slaves, not daughter-in-laws. Wow. Yep. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for that deep um, insight, uh, Zainna. Um, we've got one question um, via WhatsApp. It's just come through. I wanted to ask you regarding the topic of divorce. I had a seven months marriage. <clears throat> During those seven months, my husband was constantly believing that I was cheating on him, but I wasn't. He didn't want me to work, forced me to stay at home, and he used to beat me. One day it became really hard and I went to the hospital. I told my parents, they made me realize that this is not a safe marriage and I asked for a divorce. I am right, this is, this is a question. I am right, can I ask him the divorce? He didn't give me any of my jewelry and all that I got for our wedding and I didn't ask for it. Is it right that he can keep all of the material things that should belong to me? This we're going to be discussing mm. when we're going to talk about the khul'a okay. and you know the mubarat and the you know the hakim al shara and so and on. We're and going to types. discuss this further. Yes. And what it seems has taken place over here right. is what's known as the khul'a divorce, okay. where you because you are the one who's initiated this, uh -huh. therefore the dowry and maybe something extra has to be mm -hmm. uh, given back. However. Right. Once again, it places a major question mark okay. on the justice in relation to giving divorce to men in Islam. Right. I ask everybody who's watching this show, show me a verse in the Quran, a clear verse in the Quran with no ambiguity. Okay that says the right of divorce is for the husband only. in Islam okay. only. Show me a verse. I ask those out there, show me a hadith that says very clearly, yeah. the right of divorce is only for the man in Islam. When this Lady, mm -hmm. seven months has been beaten black and blue. Yeah. She has to wait for that permission. Who's beating her? She has to wait for him. No, I, I don't get it. Like, you know, I, I always believe in this idea that whatever revelation reaches a conclusion on, so does our intellect. And whatever intellect reaches a conclusion on revelation would. But I also believe in intrinsic moral values and understanding of them by the human being, mm -hmm. which we discuss in Usul al Fiqh when we discuss Mustaqillat Aqliya and so right, on. Right. Now, when we're looking at this area, how is it justice? We both enter a contract called marriage, we are both got 50 50 partnership, but you seemingly have all the decision making skills. And the other one doesn't. Doesn't. So what is this contract then? How is it binding? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not understanding. I know that there are people who show ayahs in the Quran involving words such as, and when you divorce them, mm -hmm. when he divorced them. So they'll say, look, the haq is with the man. Oh, yeah. I want you to show me a clear verse in the Quran. If not, in the world of hadith, okay. Okay. show me a clear verse, or a clear hadith, sorry, where it says, Right of divorce is only with the man. Right. 
And when you normally tell somebody about the right divorce for the woman, they'll say, well, yeah, you can have the khul'ah divorce. Mm-hmm. No, no, not the khul'ah. A woman has been beaten black and blue. Mm-hmm. And that woman has been treated abysmally. And she looks at that husband of hers and he's like, the religion that you love and the religion that I love says that when I decide, yeah. is when you can leave this relationship. Can someone please explain to me how it is just? Now, you know what reasons are normally given. So someone might give a reason such as, well, women are more emotional than men. I'd be emotional if someone's punching my face. Of course. You know, I'd be emotional. Yeah. I'd be emotional if someone's kicking me at home and I can't tell my dad. I'd be emotional if I'm getting kicked at home and tell my dad and my dad tells me, don't tell anyone because if people find out, then your daughters will not get married. Yeah. Emotional? I agree that I have been involved in cases where someone tells you, I want to divorce him now, I want to divorce him now, and you're like, are you sure? I want to divorce him now, I want to divorce him now. I've changed my mind, I don't want to divorce him. Change my mind, I do want to divorce him. I, I agree. Okay. That, listen, the mother who God gave the ability to raise us and give birth to us with those beautiful emotions, there'll be emotions in other ways as well. True, true. <laughs> but is that enough for a person to say, that's why the men, men are not emotional? Men are not rash. Yeah. Men do not regret a moment where they may have called for a divorce. Then there are others who say, well, men are the maintainers of women. Because they therefore have to pay for everything, Allah gave them the right to divorce. Uh, I, I, that doesn't make sense to me. Right. It really doesn't make sense to me. What if the woman's maintaining the man? Yes, true. And it does happen Then now. there are women out there who, if it's earn not for them, more. the mortgage is not getting paid. Yeah, that's right. They earn more than some, than some men. Yeah. And so... There needs to be a reevaluation of this area. Right. Which I'm sure we can go into further when we begin to look at the different avenues that may be used. Okay. Sure next, you know, in the next show. But this whole concept that the right of divorce is for the man only in Islam. And that the woman has to go from office to office. Maulana to Maulana. Father to father. Mother to mother. Community to community. And still beg. Mm-hmm. And you know, people will say to the woman, you know, you're emotional. I, I don't think she's going to let out her frustration yeah. because she's emotional. For her to have decided that she wants to leave a relationship is not easy. No. no. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, passionate response, uh, I have to say. Thank you. Um, another message from WhatsApp. Um, now, this person's actually qu- um, quoted a name of an alim, and I'm intentionally not going to read the alim's name. I've recently been through a divorce. I was married for four months. My wife just paid a UK <coughs> alim £1,000 to process her divorce. No sharia process was followed, and I received the papers for khullah. Okay? No reasons were provided for divorce. My wife made up allegations against me, which were false. Uh, the alim didn't contact didn't conduct any investigation. He accepted the wife's version of events as being true. No meeting, no nothing. I discovered she was, a sec- she was in a sexual relationship with a non-Muslim man and lives with him. I approached the alim and informed him. He just ignored and said it would be a non-fault divorce, whatever that means. I had to approach a Sunni alim to get the divorce done properly. What is the Sayyid's view on such business taking places and alims or imams, as he's put, conducting themselves in such a fashion? You could get bad, you could get good and bad in all professions and in Mm. all walks of life. I think the first role of anyone in this position (coughs) is that they have to hear both sides of the story. story. Because if, say, for example, a lady has gone to a maulana in the community and she's asked the maulana for help yeah, because the husband is treating her abysmally and the husband is arrogantly telling her Islam doesn't allow you unilaterally to have the right for divorce. Mm -hmm. So when she's gone towards that maulana, the maulana can easily, for example, call the wakil of the marja. Hakim al-shara may have a representative somewhere. And that representative will listen to what she has to say. And is that the, near, the, the norm, as it were? Yeah, so because what, what happened in the past, when you're going through a very difficult time, yeah. 
your husband's not maintaining you and for example there's no sexual relations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you don't know what to do because you were told in the past that you know you as a woman it's very frowned upon for you to go looking for a divorce yeah now what you have is that you can clearly go to the rep of the marja and the rep of the marja has a duty and that duty is to call call who call your husband right. and ask him the question what's happening here likewise that Mawlana, if he hears that you have treated the uh, you have been treated badly the Mawlana should call that person there and say to him that listen there's an allegation against you okay what do we do about this allegation right. talk to me okay how do we verify if you are doing something let me advise you i must admit that there are cases um which are sad mm. you know where a payment annuls a relationship um, but can it can it actually happen behind the other's back without them knowing no no what really has to unless that guy the only situation i can think of right she has said to the maulana that the person doesn't maintain her and there is no physical relations between them and the Mawlana tried his hardest to contact this person oh, I see. in every which way possible. Not, okay, let me make one phone call. No, I couldn't get through to him, divorced. No. Okay. Tried in every which way possible to contact him. Right. Where he could see, for example, that the, the person's read the WhatsApp message, two mm -hmm. ticks, mm -hmm. blue ticks. Got you. You know, even <laughs> the one where you pretend that you haven't read it and it's yeah. like, looks yeah. gray, but you know, you've read it. And, uh, you know, or, or the person's left voicemails. And that person's not even replying. Mm -hmm. In that situation, the Maulana might turn around and say, well, you are probably right. The person's been away for so long. He is not helping out. He clearly is not maintaining you. And the Maulana may have been a rep of a particular marja who therefore is able to decide that this can, for example, be issued. But this is not the way to go about things. You know, normally you'll be able to get through to the person. Right. The bigger problem we face yeah. is what happens when we get through to the person and the person suddenly becomes Angel Jibra'il. Right. Because sometimes you might get through to someone, he's the worst human being. But, Salam Mawlana, how are you? How's everything? How's the family? Tip top. And, and, and you're like, listen, is this, of course it's not true. I, I love my wife. I'm going to be with her through thick and thin. Right. And the moment he finishes that conversation, he goes and tells her, what, what did you try and do? Yeah. You see? You tried to go behind my back. I'll tell the Mawlana. That. That's where I believe mm -hmm. the question mark has to be opened up and raised and discussed concerning woman's right for divorce in Islam. Okay, okay. The unilateral right given to men, I believe only can bring about injustice. Mm. Yeah. So do you think it should be revised? <coughs> the question is, in its origin, was it ever meant to be for men only? Okay, okay, good point. Yeah, good I, point. I'm no one to come and just say we revise things. Okay. Although in the world of Mu'amalat being different from the world of Ibadat, possibly there is always the question mark of mm -hmm. a revamping or a reform. But I think in this particular case, mm -hmm. I think if you're looking for a verse in the Quran or in Hadith, I know, you know, you're looking at Lum Ad Damashqiyya, Rawd al Bahiyya, you know, Shahid al Awa, Shahid al Thani. Yeah, there yeah, are traditions yeah. which are mentioned, which may be given indication. For example, Imam al Baqir divorcing his wife. And they say that, look, the fact that the imam initiates it means the haq of divorce is, with the, is with, the, with, with the man. But his wife is a nasabi, possibly, who has cursed mm -hmm. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And so she apostatizes in that moment and therefore has it really got anything to do with that. Then there are other traditions where they look at Imam al-Sadiq and his companions questioning the rights of a wife to go ahead with a divorce and whether these traditions are to be taken in some cases as sound, you know, reliable or not. You know, there are, there are interesting discussions yes, on this yes, area. Yes. But I think it needs to be reassessed in the worldview of justice. Sure. In relation to a woman's right Absolutely. for divorce. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank, you for, thank you for that. We've got another question. Now, this question <clears throat> ties in with another question that I was going to actually put forward to you from another person. Um, I have been married for a couple of years, have no kids. My ex has cheated multiple times behind my back. He has also <coughs> attempted to sexually assault my family member. Sexually. 
uh, assault my family member. Your ex, her ex has cheated? Yeah, 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 my ex has cheated. So she's divorced him now? Well, this is what I'm going to come oh. back to now. Um, my ex has cheated multiple times behind my back. He has also attempted to sexually assault my family member. Do I need, do I still need him to divorce, give me the divorce? We have been living separately for a year now. So essentially, in her mind, you know, they're living apart indefinitely, um, but they need that piece of paper, I suppose, you know, to say that they've... Yeah, divorced. divorce proceedings... But does she, does he need to... It, I don't know about his belief system. I, you know, I, clearly the person is morally not responsible enough to be in this relationship, and he clearly has no relation with his wife and is not maintaining the family. They've been separated for a year. This should be a, a formality for it to be... Uh, and what can she do, though? She goes to the rep of the marja, okay, and okay. the rep of the marja will make a call, right? And is it true you've been separated for a year? Is it true that you're not in relations with your wife? You're not maintaining them. Divorce okay. is done. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Another question. Then we'll go back to the content. Um, Salam. Quick question for the Sayed: When a woman divorces and wants to remarry, but she has children. What is the ruling on who keeps full custody of the children? What is the right of the women and men in this scenario? Thank you. We have in the coming mm. part of this series, what happens after divorce? After divorce. Financially, children. Yes. Idda, okay. Revocable okay. divorce, irrevocable. irrevocable. All of this is coming. Inshallah. 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 But generally, just to give a general answer, although these situations I will elaborate on further, Inshallah. is Inshallah. that, you know, if you're going to move on with another marriage, normally the custody of the children, age of two, age of seven, um, son, daughter would go back to your ex. However, it's recommended that because of an attachment to the mother, that they. Mm that you try and find a way in which they stay with the mother. I'll elaborate on that in the fourth commission. Okay, yeah. inshallah, inshallah. So um, about 15 minutes ago, um, you passionately uh, put forward, uh, I must say, you know, some positive light in terms of the sister who was actually getting up 4 a.m. and she was treated like a slave and, you know, it just doesn't cut it, as it were. Um, Similarly, we've had another sister who's contacted us. Um, she's in love with her husband. Yeah. Um, they're very close. Um, but there's been interference. The stereotypical interference, as it were, from the husband's parents. She can't cope. And she's um, descended into somewhat depression, as it were. And also starting to harm herself, which is very sad. Um, the husband is totally oblivious. <coughs> Um, and she even hides it from him. Can she separate for a time? And if you can possibly just shed some light on this separation, um, is it recommended at all? And so, so, so if we just start, just backtrack a little bit, can she separate for a time, first of all? Well, separation can be done at any time. And what sort of separation is that in terms of parallel to Islamic living? Yeah, so look, you're still you're still in a relation with each other mm. physically. Mm. You'll still be intimate with each other. Okay. Well, you may, but have to be. Yes. Sorry. Have to be intimate. Yeah, the rights are still there. Right. There is no such thing as I'm separated from you, and therefore I don't want to get close to you. Although okay. both of you probably understand that it's a delicate moment where you don't want to necessarily stress on these things. Right. Um, because you have other areas which you feel are more important that mm. need to be resolved. Yeah. Obviously, physically speaking, you sound yeah. like you're okay, yeah. but there's other areas that need to be resolved. Sure. So is it, you're just having a timeout? A timeout. And I think it's understandable. Rather than okay. straight away saying divorce, okay. see if there is a timeout period okay. where maybe you can, you know, have... If you look Quranically, mm -hmm. God talks of, for example, arbiters coming in. Yeah, yeah. An arbiter from one side, an arbiter, an arbiter from, from another. Yeah. These arbiters could be a maulana, could be wise men of the community. They have a role in seeking to provide you with guidance. Or you may say, for example, maulana, or you may say to an uncle of yours who's the elder of the family, that this person, his parents, the way they're treating me has made our relationship become bad. Yeah. And I do feel sorry for some guys where they have to balance that in-laws and the wife relationship and so on. The elder of your family, when the Quran is saying bring the arbiters, mm -hmm. bring somebody of respect who yeah. can put a word in that, look, 
if you two love each other and you as a family are a respectable family, don't let it descend into this. Remember, it's not obligatory for a girl to live with her husband's parents. Respecting husband's parents, respect like any person in this world, you have to show tolerance, you have to show morals. True. But there's no such thing as I have to have give to. your dad a cup of tea when he wants. Yeah. Yeah, my humility, my love for you, my respect for your for the foundation of our children's grandparents. You know, th that comes into it. However, you can move out with your wife. The problem yeah. is some of the parents are troublesome. True. Why have you moved out? <clears throat> Why have you become like these modern families? It's not about modern family. My wife wants to walk around the house naked. Mm. She can't if dad's always around in the sink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, th there are some, believe you me, they live in a house, believe you me, where sometimes the in-laws dictate when the two of them can be together. Yeah, yeah. There are I've some who the in-laws knock on the wall, stop making noise. What do you mean stop making noise? What are we doing? Going to live uh, through just about this year. When we go to sleep, we read a book. When we're sleeping next to each other, of course there's going to be some noise made. Yeah. And this has caused so many divorces unnecessarily. Like she said, I love my husband. Mm -hmm. But my husband is reaching a situation now where He's saying, look, these are my parents. Yeah. And the, more, you know, the people in my position, Molans, we always mention heaven is underneath the feet of the mother. And so on. person's thinking, well, you know what? My mother's this, my father's this, but my wife is this. Now, what do I do? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so separation is jais, as it were, or allowed. Um, um, there's another one here, which I'm just going to try and um, read out very quickly, because I think we've just got about just under 10 minutes. Um, two questions. Um, I have been married for eight years. Me and my husband can't have children together because he has a problem and there is no treatment. Do I have a right to ask for divorce? Second question. If I decided to have a child and stay with my husband, the other option is to get an anonymous sperm donor and have kids. Is this okay in Islam? So. It's it's a good question. <coughs> yeah. First question. Mm -hmm. Do I have a right tried, to ask for divorce? Yeah. You, well, you've got a right to ask for a divorce. There's no doubt whatsoever. Okay. And I think the most appreciative will be your husband. Because he's appreciated your patience. Okay. And he might be the one who shows kindness in this stage. To say, listen, maybe move on in your life and marry somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Marriage is not annulled at this moment. Right. Unless he blatantly hid his impotency from you, for example. Okay. It doesn't look like the... Doesn't really look like there's no uh, th there's a sexual issue, but maybe pregnancy, and you know there are people who took twelve years to get pregnant, yeah, you know, some yeah. fifteen years. So it's not something that automatically becomes divorce. In terms of artificial mm -hmm. insemination yeah. by donor is not allowed in Islam. Okay, artificial insemination by the husband, the sperm of the husband is allowed in Islam. Only the husband, the not husband, an artificial donor, not not from right. the uh, donor. And the husband, if he is going to provide sperm, cannot masturbate themselves to provide the sperm. They would have had to have been pleasured by their partner, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the sperm to be provided for that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're starting to come in now quite fast. Um, I was living under domestic violence by my husband for a year and, since, and then moved to my parents' house. Since then, I have been asking for a divorce from the known sheikhs and scholars. But none has helped me. It's been seven months that we've been separated. What should I do in this situation? Now, I find as well, I've actually had that response um, relayed to me by a number of people that some alims, Sayyid alims, sheikh alims are just not helping out as much. Yes, I've heard this as well. I also saw how your earpiece just fell off, but yeah. I'll go past that. But <laughs> I've, I've heard that as well, and I've seen that, you mm -hmm. know, it, it can be difficult as well. Let's, let's not make it sound like it's always um, easy for a Maulana to sort out a divorce. You, you know, in many cases, Maulanas can't win. No. If they give an opinion that one side's right, the others hate them for life. Yeah. 
You give the opinion that that side's right, the, these lot hate you for life. Mm -hmm. And you have to see their faces in Salat al-Jama'ah, and Salat al-Jum'ah, and Wilad, and Shahada, and Muharram, and Shahar Ramadan, and they want you to resolve everything for them. What I do believe, I personally have an opinion, that when I see someone has beaten their wives, yeah. I'm straight away of the opinion that try and help that lady get her divorce there and then. There's no need for talking over this, because that person who can beat their wives with the bruising and everything, but I also have the opinion that there may be some relationships that come to an end. Now I know that the Quran says Mawadda and Rahma. Mawadda, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reciprocal love. Rahma is the mercy you show when you're getting older. Right. Yes. I understand that. But I also understand that some die out. There's no conversations yes. anymore. Right. Um, there's no romantic edge anymore. You're just there because you don't want the community the to say that there's been a breakup. Yeah, unlabeled. Now, what do you do? Like, it's really difficult. And so when you go to a Mawlana, in some cases, the Mawlana will turn around and say, you know, but if you break up, the kids may be affected and so on. So some Mawlanas provide good answers. Right. Um, some might say, well, seven months I've tried. Seven months is not crazy at all. Because that Mawlana might be saying that, listen, it's a seven month period. And I appreciate what you're going through. It's a major life decision that you're making. And some don't realize, A, grass is green on the other side. There are many couples you look at and they look like, you know, the couples that show their happiness the most in some cases are the most unhappy. Yeah. Um, then I think, secondly, it's important for us to understand that someone who's divorced in the community, it's hard for them to get married. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, the divorcee and the widow were two areas where Arabia found it difficult to forgive the divorcee and found it difficult to forgive the widow. Widows done nothing wrong. Divorcee, they always imagine that, you know, you don't want to marry a divorcee, for example. And so what you have is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, married a divorcee and he married a widow. Our communities, if you're labeled as a divorcee, it's a problem. Especially for the ladies, the sisters in our community. Therefore, some Mawlanas may not straight away say to you that yes, because they also know that the decision is a big one. It's a huge decision. Okay. Some cases the kids are looking at you and even look at the Mawlana and say don't make it easy in some cases. So there's a number of factors involved. Right, okay, fine. We've only got a few minutes uh, left, uh, Sayyidina. Uh, so I'm going to cram in yep. a couple of questions. Um, the last question uh, via WhatsApp is, if you divorce your spouse more than three times, can you remarry the same one person? Now, divorce the spouse three times, um, if you can maybe just... I will that. elaborate on the divorce, 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 mm. and three separate divorces in our next show. Yes, I think so that's quite... The, difference in the, the differences in the school in Islam sure. and the pronunciation of divorce. Many okay. people ask me, the pronunciation of divorce, Arabic only, or can it be in a different language okay. as well? Okay. What if I turn around to my wife and say, Talik, 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 in one go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some schools in Islam say it's divorce. What does the Shia school? Next week's show, we're going to be looking at, you've reached the stage of divorce, legally, what takes place at this stage. Right, yeah. okay. I think this is just going to be one last question, Sayyidina. So, um, we've got another question. If a wife is not being maintained, um, and her husband doesn't have sexual intercourse with her either. Um, from a fiqh or theological point of view, what is the stance on this compared to that of Christianity, if there is one? Well, Christianity, divorce-wise, you'll have... You can, know, she, can she ask for the divorce? Can she, can, what's... This again comes back. If financially, yeah. mm -hmm. he's not maintaining her. Right. And he's blatant about it. Okay. Not someone who's going through a bad time economically, financially. No, he's blatant. Why should I maintain you? Gotcha. Go to your parents. Right. And there's no relations between them. There should be a relation. You know, there should be relations between them. Mm -hmm. um, and should never be a period longer than four months where you two are not in a relation with each other. If you look at some traditions. Yes. If that person, there's no relations between his wife in that way, or he's not maintaining, and he admits this, the marriage is done. If he admits this. Okay, yeah. okay. So what we The do Mawlana, the Hakim al shara uh -huh. would speak to him, he's admitted it to him, they then undertake for the divorce proceedings to okay. go ahead. Okay, very quickly, very quickly. We'll try and continue this last point, inshallah, next week. Next week. Um, but there's a clear verse in, um, with respect to arbitration, the Holy Quran talks about in Surah Nisa, verse 35. And I'll just 
very quickly read the translation. And if you fear a breach between the two, then appoint a judge from his people and a judge from her people, if they both desire agreement. Allah will effect harmony between them. Surely Allah is knowing, aware. So my question or point is this, that we'll hopefully, inshallah, continue this episode and this point actually into the next one. But is, it, is this arbitration right at the end? Very quickly. Is it when it's, there's a, a clear necessity? Yeah, so you don't, you, you don't necessarily want to, in some cases, yeah. move from argument to divorce. Right. I think the wise of the community... And I've intentionally quoted that just to make mm. sure that people know that you, know, you don't just take drastic action. Correct. And, yeah. The wise of the community should get together. Right. The wise of the family should speak with the wise of the other family. Okay. Sit, sit down, begin to retrace their mm -hmm. roots, begin to retrace their relationship and say, where are we heading now? Yes. Why has it reached this stage? Yes. And remember one thing, when you come to an arbitration, don't come in an angry mood. Right. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, says, Amir al says wonderfully, don't make decisions when you, don't make promises when you are happy. Okay. And don't make decisions when you are angry. Right. And the problem is in many of these divorce arbitration cases, before we've even got to the Mawlanas and everyone, you've got two arbiters, we're already going into this discussion in a very bad mood. Yeah. If you make a decision when you're angry, Imam Ali does not, he says, do not do that. And so I think what's needed psychologically, go into that. Istighfar, ghusl, wudu, okay. dua, mm -hmm. Quran, then enter it. Clear heart, Ya Allah, whatever gets me closer to you, let it happen. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Go in there and try your hardest. I'm not saying this for all cases, because we mentioned there are some crazy cases, but then there are some cases where there's been a little, t there's been a little mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. some, I, Bring the arbitration, go in there with respect, go in there with akhlaq, yeah. even if you two decide to end it, but maintain amicability, maintain right. that respect, um, so that the religion is represented in the best of ways and you represent yourself in the best of ways. Likewise, sometimes that person who has been brought as an arbiter, uh, always try and make sure that that person is somebody who's known for their calmness and patience. Mm -hmm and for having a lot of experience with these issues. That may not necessarily be the Mawlan of your community. No, no. It may be somebody who's been a chairman, a president of your community, somebody who's done a lot of counseling, you know. Um, those people tend to give good advice. Yes, yes, Advice yes. from the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt, But as you said wonderfully, the Quran said, get arbiters, before you make any of these decisions, sit all of you, listen to their advice, mm -hmm. reflect on your behavior. Maybe you look in the mirror and you realize, that when you point three fingers at anyone, there's always two One. pointing back at you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, viewers, we've run out of time from Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani and myself, Muhammad Ali. Asalaamu As Alaikum, inshallah, we'll see you again next week where we'll continue the topic of Islamic divorce and we'll propel this forward into the further steps that uh, Dr. Sayyid Aman was speaking about. Um, please also call in and also to do generously donate if you can on Imam Hussain TV. Imam Hussain TV does need your funds. Um, the, call, the number to call actually is 0203 515 0199 and also WhatsApp 4407939 91763. Once again from both of us, Asalaamu Alaikum.